Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Hey, everybody. This is Tank Sinatra. You're listening to the Think Tank Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm glad to have you here. If you're enjoying the show, please do me a favor. Head over to iTunes and leave a review. I love reading them. And if you want access to the full archive with episodes such as Jesse Itzler, Dan Soder, Derek Huff, DMC, go to gasdigitalnetwork.com and use promo code TANK for two free weeks and access to all the other shows on the network. Enjoy the episode. Are they all here? All but one. But I'm going anyway. I'm the best at what I do. You're listening to the Think Tank Podcast. Look at that fucking smile on my face. With your host, Tank Sinatra. So welcome to the Think Tank, nobody, because (laughs) nobody's here. It's just me um, and my thoughts. And I'm doing this because the guests don't want to come on anymore. (laughs) Everyone's sick and tired of my shit. No, um... Shannon, my producer, had a great idea. She said, why don't you just come on? You talk so much all the time anyway. Why don't you just fucking have nobody be here when you do it? And I thought, all right, great. I just don't know where to look. You know what I mean? For guests? No, right now. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what to look at. Uh, You can look at the camera. Oh, where's the camera? It's this one right here. Which one? Right there? Yep. Yep. Okay. No, that's even weirder. So look at me. It's fine. (laughs) Okay. Um, Basically... This is not the way things are going to be. So if you're a listener, don't worry. It's not just going to be me all the time. But... I don't know. I, I I assume if you're listening, you're interested in what I have to say. So I'm just gonna give you more of that, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I do have a topic, a few topics in mind that I want to go over. Um, one of them is a question that I get all the time. But before I do that, see me taking off my jacket was like part of something to do. That's how uncomfortable I am. I just don't even know what to do here. I'm gonna read a review because the reviews have been coming in and they make me feel so good and so happy. So if you are a Tale of Two Kitties, which I don't know if that's, you know, whatever. Um, this is a long one. Uh, Marissa F. Um, she said, I genuinely enjoy the podcast. Thank you. I go through so many podcasts, join the club, because of my commute, and it's been a pleasure listening to this one because it manages to be very heartfelt and naturally conversational, yet still has content and direction. I would say that's not the easiest thing to achieve. The host is sincere, that's me, and carries that safe space to interesting guests, leaving unnecessary small talk out of the equation altogether. Thank you for your earnest approach to interviewing, your tank size feels, and unfeigned optimism, my kind of listening. That was a fucking review. That is a review that I am gonna probably get tattooed on my ribs um, so I can see it in the mirror every morning. I'm gonna get it tattooed backwards so I can read it. Yeah, we're gonna need a lot of drops today. So I have a few things that I want to talk about. The main one, people are, seem to be very confused by the whole Instagram thing. Even Joe Santagato I had in here a couple of weeks ago, and he's very successful on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. He's like, he just doesn't understand the meme thing. So I'm not going to break down memes, but I am going to tell you how I, I guess, got to where I'm at um, And in the sense of getting press. So I was on Ellen recently and I spoke to the producers of Ellen. They said, I'm good to talk about it, which is a big weight off my shoulders because I don't want to piss anybody off, especially especially them over there. But the story really starts um, a few years ago and I'll do a shortened version of this story. But I think it's, if you're trying to get press, this is going to be very valuable to you because hiring a PR person or an agent or a publicist or any anybody of that nature feels like the way to go because you can pay for it, but it is really the easy way out. You think you're going to pay for somebody to do the work for you that you really should be and could be doing yourself. There is a little bit more, depending on what kind of um, show you're trying to get on, there's a little bit more weight and credibility that comes from, you know, having somebody reach out on your behalf, but you can also say, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm, you know, Tank's publicist and I wanted to, you're still doing it. You're in control of your fate because, I don't know how to tell you this, but they don't care about your career as much as you do. They care about their career. They're getting five thousand, seventy five hundred, ten thousand dollars a month to try and get you press. They're not going to get you press. They're going to try, but if you don't have anything worth pitching or interesting, you're wasting that money. So that's the first step: is to have something that's interesting and maybe even of the moment or timely. And you can't just think it's interesting. You should really run it by people, talk to your friends, talk to your, you know, maybe even an enemy or two to find out the real deal about what you're doing, whether or not it's worth putting on a show. So the other side to that coin is that all of these people, um, you're seeing it today. 
I could have had a guest here, but I couldn't get a guest. So here I am. Whether you are a podcast host, a meme maker, a fashion blogger, a producer for Ellen, a producer for PBS, you're on the hook to create content for people to consume every day, week, or however often it is. So there's a lot of pressure on those producers also. They're literally, they are, their job is to produce content. That means find the idea, pitch it, do the story, edit the story, tell the story. And there's a lot to that. So with that said, um, it was about, I guess it was about three years ago, I was still working uh, in the fence company and ABC Nightline was doing a series called Social Stars, I think was the name of it. And they did a piece on Girl With No Job, they did a piece on Fuck Jerry. And when they did the piece on Fuck Jerry, the internet went nuts because at that time, I guess people have eased up on him and the Fetch a little bit now, but at that time people were really pissed that this guy was about to become you know, a millionaire or, or had already become a millionaire, not on the level he is now because he's killing it now. But, you know, they were pissed that this guy who, who made his career taking other people's content was getting a spotlight on ABC Nightline, which whether you love it or hate it, it's an institution in media. It's a, it's a, it's a cool thing to be on, right? So ABC Nightline did a piece on Fuck Jerry and I saw it and I was like, you know what? There's so much backlash around this piece. If I, I think if I time it right and do it properly, I can get on Nightline. And I didn't like reach out to them right away. I didn't, uh, I didn't do anything right away, which is the other thing. Patience when trying to get press is indispensable. If you're not willing to be patient, if you're gonna rush it and be desperate, I assume that that's the way you do things in your life, you know, in every aspect, whether it's going to the gym or a relationship, like just have other shit going on so that you're not waiting for the phone call from Nightline. So what I did was everything I've always done as far as press has been as super sneaky, very, very sneaky. So with ABC Nightline, I reached out to a friend of mine who I knew worked at ABC. He worked in sales. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to get him in trouble, even though he doesn't work there anymore. But still, um, I want to protect his identity. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, that piece um, that they did on Fuck Jerry, do you know who the producers were of that piece? I knew who the host was. I forgot her name. She was the one who was like the on-camera talent. Um, but it was her and somebody else who I don't want to say their name because I don't want to get them in trouble either. And they don't work at ABC anymore. But I found out who it was and I followed them on Instagram. And they had a photography page, so it wasn't like so weird or out of the norm. It was a photography slash personal page. So it wasn't so weird out of the norm for someone random to follow them. Which I, I, I assumed that she thought, oh my God, this guy with, you know, what, what I had like, 800,000 followers at the time from New York, must have a friend in common, whatever. So I followed the page and then I saw she followed me back. So I was like, all right, great. Still, I let it sit. I didn't say anything. I didn't DM. I didn't do nothing. Then I saw a picture of her with another producer from ABC and I followed that guy too. So basically I just let it sit. And then one day I got a message from her and it was basically her asking me if I make all of the memes myself. And I was like, here we go. This is the fucking, this is the moment. So I wrote, hey, yeah, I love your pictures. Just start off right away with like deflecting the question. Hey, yeah, I love your pictures. I do. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Left it at that. I didn't say, do you want to have me on Nightline tonight? Uh, I'm free if you're free. So I just let it sit again. I had other stuff going on. I had a job. I had a family. And basically they asked me, but I kind of like, I I don't know how to describe it. It would be like walking into a room full of people that you want to get to know and not saying anything and just doing cool shit, like doing push-ups. <laughs> That's not cool. I don't know. <laughs> if you walk into a room full of people you want to impress and you start doing push-ups, you're a fucking weirdo. But it might work if you're trying to get a, an article in Men's Fitness or something. I don't know. So anyway, I let, the, I let it just marinate and sit. And then they finally reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we do a, a series called Social Stars on ABC Nightline. I was like, you're kidding Wow, that's crazy. I can't believe it. Never heard of it before. And we want to have you on it. Would you be open to being on it? I said, yeah, of course, whatever, you know, whatever you guys want. So they came to my house, we set it up. And again, like patience is indispensable because they, they came to my house, shot me and it didn't air for like, if I remember correctly, it didn't air for like two months, which is a long time when you shot stuff for ABC Nightline and it's your first big piece of press and you're waiting for it to you know, waiting for it to air. So I waited, 
that Friday, it didn't air. The next Friday, it didn't air. The next Friday, it didn't air. And I texted uh, or messaged the girl on Monday. I said, hey, <laughs> this was probably a little stupid. I said, hey, is, was everything, did everything turn out with that piece okay? Like, did you guys burn the foot? Like, did you lose the footage or something? And she said, no, this was also during the election, 2016. So maybe it was four years ago. Holy crap. Anyway, um, you know, so anytime something comes up, we have to we have to use that. This is what's called an evergreen piece. Evergreen just means that it's it can always be thrown into the rotation. There's no nothing timely about it. It's just filler. So it finally aired, and it was huge. The other thing that I want to uh, get across is that nobody cares about your press as much as you care about your press. And it's it really, I mean, ABC Nightline was good for me to post because it was like, yeah, I, you know, I was on ABC Nightline, but it didn't really move the needle for me as far as followers go or anything like that. It was just another thing to put in the press kit to try and get bigger press. But it, it didn't really move, like I said, move the needle for me as far as I had a book coming out at the time. I didn't sell any more books. It was just like I, uh, something to go in my file of like, see, I'm real. Like I'm really here and I'm really doing stuff. So had I not done that, I don't know if I would have gotten the other press because the other thing about press is that press begets press. So if you do something, you will inevitably, inevitably get a call for two or three things later on that you may or may not want to do. Maybe it's something smaller, maybe it's something of equal size. But after that happened, I did hire a publicist and he was really cheap. He was inexpensive relatively. And uh, he just, I mean, it, it, you have to also wonder or answer the question, why do you want press? What do you think it's going to do for you? Do you have something to say? Do you have a product or a service that you're trying to get exposure for? Because if you just want to get press to get press, save your save your energy and save your time and put that into creating the content that you think is worthy of even getting press. Because press for the sake of press is is useless. I hate to say it, but it really does take a lot of deliberate thinking and figuring out whether or not this is something that you want to you know, that, that is worth your time because it does take time away from other things that you're doing. Not only setting it up, but actually doing it and then, you know, it takes a spot for the content. So maybe you wanted to post something else. But anyway, that was the Nightline thing. The Ellen thing is a much, much better, sneakier story, I think. And it's a long story. So I'm going to try and trim it down as much as possible. We're already 12 minutes in. I could do this Every day, You're Shannon. killing it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I even saying anything though? Absolutely. Do you care? I care. You care. Because I would like to get more eyes on like my own personal podcast. So I'm taking notes for myself. Mm. All right, good. So this is the How to Get Press episode. I don't know if I'm going to even talk about the other stuff because getting press is, is a whole monster in and of itself. I mean, you could you could ask a publicist and they say it's all about relationships it's not because everybody's accessible. It's not, I mean, it's kind of a little bit maybe about relationships. If you're trying to get on Jimmy Kimmel and you know the, you know, the booker, that's cool. But you could also find out who that is on LinkedIn. It's really not, you know, everything is accessible. Information is all out there. So Ellen, I've always wanted to be on Ellen, always. When I was living in California, before Ellen, there was Oprah, for those of you who don't know. Oprah was like the big dog in the daytime talk show uh, spot. I'm sure everybody knows that. But Oprah was doing something called Win Your Own Show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And I sent in a video for that. I got votes. Then I went to the open casting call. It was a great experience, but I, I fucking blew it. I was horrible at the live audition. I was absolutely terrible. You only got like 30 seconds to pitch your idea. What can you really say in 30 seconds? They know what they're looking for. They probably weren't looking for some 29-year-old fitness guy is white, straight. Like, it's just like, it wasn't what they were, it, it wasn't happening for me. And I really didn't have any good ideas anyway for a show. I want to talk to people, nobody cares. So with Ellen, Ellen pranks people, which everybody knows, but she pranked her producer, Kevin Lehman. Somebody jumped out from an office door and scared the shit out of him. And on the Ellen show on Instagram, she tagged his Instagram, Kay Lehman, I think the third or I, 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 or whatever it is. And, um, and I clicked on it and it said, follow back. And I was like, oh, here we go. Insert baby at the window doing this gif. Cause I was like, oh, this is how it's gonna happen. And I knew it at that moment that if I waited long enough and I was consistent enough with what I was doing, then I was gonna get on the show. I didn't know how, I didn't know for what, but I knew that I would eventually be sitting on that stage. And I had like 
this vision of walking out into this manic feeling. And I'll get to that later, but that's exactly what happened. I had like this, this intuition of like this feeling that I had where I was, I knew I was going to be on the show. So anyway, I reached out to Kevin um, about two months or so after I followed him. And, uh, and it was when the Game of Games season two premiered and I saw his name listed as an executive producer. Now, producer and executive producer are different. Executive producer is a, a little bit higher than a producer. The producers do more work, but the executive producers have probably been there longer and have more say in how things go. So I knew that he was like pretty high up on the chain over there. So I sent him a message and I said, hey, I'm watching Game of Games. I just saw your name. Congratulations, the show is great. So he wrote back to me immediately and said, oh, thanks so much. We worked so hard on it. By the way, when me and my fiance uh, got engaged or me and my boyfriend got engaged, I appreciate the comment because we're both fans of yours and it meant a lot to us. And believe it or not, still in this day and age, it's hard to be gay in society. So I was like, all right, cool. So I don't care if you're gay or not. It does not matter to me at all. I was just, anytime, now that I'm married, when somebody meets somebody that actually, <laughs> that actually likes them, I'm like, good for you. Because it's fucking hard to meet somebody who you like and also likes you. So gay, straight, you meet somebody who you want to spend your life with, congratulations, like a huge congratulations. So that was where that comment was coming from, which I didn't even remember writing. I had to go back and look. So I said, if it's, it's okay with you, I would like to um, set up a call. I have an idea that I think might work on your show. Ellen, obviously, it was assumed. I wasn't pitching something for Game of Games. So he said, um, all right, yeah, I'll call you whatever it was, Thursday or Friday night. This was, oh, no, I'm sorry. It was a Tuesday because there's more to the story. So I, I wrote out, I, I reached out to him and we spoke on a Tuesday of this one week. And I remember being in the car on the way home, talking to him and I said, I said, I, I have this other page, Tanks Good News. He goes, yeah, I know, we all love it. I was like, all right, great. I didn't say that, but in my head, I'm like, that's, you know, walking into a room or being on the phone call or being on a phone call with someone who's already a fan of what you do makes it so much easier. So I said, so you know what the what the page is. You guys do a lot of that, you know, you're, you're, yourself. You do a lot of human interest pieces, but I think I could bring an interesting edge to it being that I'm from New York. I don't look like I should run this type of page. I don't look like I should be interested in these type of stories. I look like I should be voting Trump 2020 and drinking beer and smashing fucking nails into plywood. That's what I look like. So... I said, I think it might be an interesting edge. And he said, I didn't say that, by the way. I didn't talk about Trump or beer or anything like that. Um, I said, I think it might be an interesting edge if I come on there and present these stories in a, in a, in a, a light fashion. Because some of these stories start off pretty grave. And then I can bring some levity to it by goofing around with the people and bringing out, you know, making them smile or whatever. So he said, all right, let me talk to the producers about it. And I will get back to you. And I said, all right, great. Again, no expectations. Like it, it was all my main responsibility and my main focus when I'm working is effort. I don't care about the results. The results take care of themselves if you put the effort in. And nine times out of 10, the results that come from a lack of expectation are a thousand times better than what you think you want to do. So I, I, I waited and um, I said, all right, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I'll let you go. And we hung up. And then that Friday, I saw a producer call, uh, named Corey Pallant, who's a producer on The Ellen Show, follow Tank Sinatra, he followed Tank's Good News, and then he followed my personal page. So I saw this person follow my page, all three of my pages, and I clicked on them and it said producer for The Ellen Show. And I was like, all right, I guess they had the talk. So I waited, I didn't reach out to the guy, I didn't, you know, I think I followed him back from one of my pages. And uh, he called me on Tuesday out of nowhere, the next Tuesday. So it was Tuesday, Friday, Tuesday. He called me out of nowhere. It was a cold call coming through on my phone, but it said 818, which uh, is Burbank. And I was like, if it's a, you know, if it's a, a, a robo call, I'll just hang up on it, but I'm going to pick it up because I think it might be something good. So I pick it up and he says, hey, this is Corey Pallant from The Ellen Show. Is this Tank? And I said, yeah. And like, that was kind of, it was when you're trying to do something well, when I'm trying to do something, I should say, I really hang on those little victories every step of the way. The big victories, I, I'm gonna sound so dumb right now, but Drake has some good lines about working. And Drake says, so I'm gonna sound like an idiot. Can you just play the song? I don't even tell you what song. No, it's, he says, so get it while you're here, boy, because all that hype don't feel the same next year, boy. I know, I sound fucking stupid, but 
the lesson in that line is like, getting a call from a producer felt almost the same as walking out onto the stage because there had been so many little minor victories along the way that got bigger and bigger and bigger as time went on. So that call from him felt like a major win. I was like, great, I got a phone call. I had a good call with the guy. We talked for like an hour. He said, I'm gonna just run this up the chain and uh, and I'll, I'll call you back and I'll let you know what we're thinking. So the next call was, yeah, we're gonna fly you out here and we wanna shoot some stuff with you for digital. I said, all right, great. Because at this point, if you're thinking that, and they, I was just listening to a, a podcast on the way here with uh, two of my favorites. It was actually, it was a hybrid podcast. It was The Fighter and the Kid. So Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen with Chris Stefano and Giannis Papa. So it was History Hyenas, Fighter and the Kid. It was fucking, it was crazy. But they were talking about, and I completely and totally agree, how digital versus linear, there's really no, it's almost, digital is almost better now because you get so many more eyeballs. And really the only reason people want to get on TV is because they think that's where the eyeballs are. But that's an old way of thinking. I'm not saying if you can get on the right show, obviously the eyeballs are there. But then if a show has four or five million viewers, that means they have a massive digital presence also. So the bigger the show, the bigger the digital presence, but it really is all about the digital at the end of the day. So I went out there to shoot a bunch of stuff with them for digital. And that was in... May of uh, of 2019. And I didn't hear a word from them for like three months, nothing, until I reached out to them and I said, hey, did you like watch the stuff that we shot or did you watch it and was it horrible? Or I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what, what happened here. And he's like, no, no, we, we haven't even watched it yet to be honest with you. I was like, all right, fuck you, dude. Um, I didn't say that and I didn't think that either if you're listening to this. I did not say fuck you. I said, I don't know what that means. You didn't listen, you didn't watch it. Um, I'm gonna assume that you guys are just really busy because every time I reach out to this guy, I mean, these people over at the Ellen Show work their asses off because that's a monster show and it's a machine, which I'll get to. So he says, no, we didn't really, we didn't watch it yet. And I didn't know at the time until later why they hadn't watched it. So they we shot in May, June, July, August. I'm like, what's, you know, what's happening here? And then finally in September, September, early, early September, like September 1st or 2nd, I got an email from another show, which I'm not gonna mention because I don't want them to get upset. But I got another, I got an email from another daytime talk show who said, hey, um, you know, we love what you do. We wanna have Tanks Good News be a segment on the show. We want you to have, we wanna have you on like five or six times over the next season. And I was like, all right, great. Cause I haven't heard from the Ellen people. So I'm just gonna, just gonna do this show. And before I decided or actually before I told them that I could do it, I reached out to the Ellen people one more time and I said, hey, I just, you know, I wanted to let you know, I'm not doing this to try and like force your hand or anything. I'm just letting you know so that if one day you turn on the TV and you see me on this show, you're not like, what the hell, what the hell happened? So I just wanted to communicate to you that they want to have me on the show. They want to do like five or six appearances over the the next, whatever, however long a season is, eight, nine months. And um, I appreciate all you did. I'm sorry it didn't work out. And he just shut it. He's like, ah, no, 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 absolutely not. He goes, we, you know, our season wrapped in May and we have been largely on autopilot, just kind of keeping up with what needs to be kept up with. We had planned to call you. I'm sorry we didn't call you like a day sooner, but um, we're going to book you on the show this season and then we're going to shoot some digital stuff. We're going to do a digital series. And I was like, all right, let's, you know, Let's do that. So I reached, I called the other show and I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And only because, you know, um, I've been talking to the Ellen people for so long. I want to honor that commitment. I didn't realize that the seasons ended in May and started in September, yada, yada, yada. So I, um, I get booked for September, <laughs> September 24th or 25th and September 21st or whatever it was, they say, we're going to move you. And I was like, here we fucking, here we go again. I cannot believe it, man. I just want to get on the show. Just please get me on the couch. So by this time I had gotten an agent who was really helpful because she can be persistent without being pushy and there's no sense of desperation. I feel like when I'm reaching out to somebody, there is a little bit of desperation. So in that sense, if you have an agent, you can use them as a tool, but not as like, you're, they're not your master. They're not gonna run your career like you're gonna run your career. So use them where necessary. And I used her with this and I said, you know, just find out, get a date for me, get a date, a definite date, a thousand percent. And by this time I had already booked 
um, a vacation for my family to Aruba uh, December 7th to the 12th. And she gets back to me and she goes, they want you on December, <laughs> they want to shoot December 11th. I was like, all right, fam, we're going to fucking California. So I switched everything. I, I you know, took my family out to California and here's the experience. So the, and this is the, the biggest question that I get. Nobody, I mean, only a few select people care about how to get more press. Everyone wants to know what it was like to be on Ellen. And here's the answer. Um, I have no, fu- I, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't, re- I barely remember a thing. I blacked out because the adrenaline hit me so hard that I felt like, so there was, there was two things that I think led to me being what I would consider to be successful on the show. It didn't feel successful when I did it, but when I watched it, I was like, all right, that wasn't that bad. It was, it was pretty good actually. So about a year ago, I started doing stand up again because the nerves that would come from something big would cripple me. My stomach would be in knots. I would be so, so nervous, anxious, irritable, f- distracted. Like I just, I, I couldn't focus on anything because I was so nervous about what I was about to do. And that was, so when I started doing stand up again, I got over that very quickly. Within like the first maybe month or two, I was like, I'm not nervous at all. And this is incredible because I feel like I can be myself on stage. I also started doing jujitsu. Now, they both worked in different ways because stand up got rid of the pre show nerves and jujitsu helped me handle the in the moment nerves. So I get to the studio on December 11th. I pull up and um, I don't know if, you know, if this is a thing outside of New York, but when I used to go out to the clubs in like whatever it was, 1999, 2000, 2001. When I would be outside on the line and I would hear the music thumping through the wall, I would get this these butterflies in my stomach. I would be excited. It would probably also because I was about to do drugs and possibly almost die, but I was, <laughs> I'd also be excited to hang out and have fun. So that music, the bass thumping through the wall was like a sign to me that like, okay, we're about to have some fun. So when I parked my car on the lot, there was a, there's a huge building and I hear women screaming through the wall. And I was like, oh boy, this is like, I'm here. This is happening. I better like, I better turn off the past, the pre- uh, the past, the future. Like I better just be in the moment right now because I'm going to miss it and I don't want to miss it. So I get inside and you are handled professionally and efficiently every step of the way from the time you park your car to the time you walk on that stage. Everybody, you're, it's, there's somebody by your side telling you where to go, telling you what to do. It's beautiful. It's like, you don't have to think at all, which is nice because it's very hard to think when you're about to be on The Ellen Show. So I get into my green room and um, the segment producer who I spoke to for about an hour the day before, I thought I was just gonna go on there and talk to a nice person for, I didn't know how long the segment was gonna be. I figured 15 minutes, totally wrong. She goes, you have six minutes. <laughs> And here are the questions and here are the answers. And I, they were from the pre-interview, but it was still like, shit, I have to remember stuff. I'm not gonna remember stuff. But then I remembered Ellen's a professional and she's gonna ask me the questions that lead me to answer the right questions and say the right thing. So that nervousness went away. So when I, I'm still not nervous. And when I get to backstage, I had, I had been watching uh, walkout videos of people that were on the show prior to me to figure out what I wanted to do. Like, how am I gonna walk out? Am I gonna wave? Am I gonna shuffle? Am I gonna dance? Where's Twitch? Where's Alan? And if you, I don't know if you can, actually you can't, Shannon, I'll I'll give you the the file of me walking out because it's not on the YouTube. All you need to know about how I felt when I was walking out is in this three seconds when they cut away from me so fast because I was like, I didn't know where I was. My eyes darted from left to right seven times in a half a second because I completely lost myself when I walk out there. And here's why. So you're standing behind this partition and I see the trees because it's like holiday season, which is, I, I forgot to mention, the reason they wanted to move me to December was because it was a good thing. It was their 12 days of giveaway, much higher ratings, more viewership, whatever. And I was like, all right, great, no problem. But I had to wait. So anyway, I'm behind the partition and I see the trees and I was like, oh, are those the trees? And I they I stuck my head out and they pushed me back behind the partition. They were like, get back, be- get back behind the wall. You can't stick your head out. Like that was the dumbest thing that I had ever seen anybody do. So that like rattled me a little bit, but still I was like, all right, I don't know, you know, it's my first time here. I don't know what's going on. So they, they say, they, they kind of like, you can't really hear that well. So you can't hear Ellen saying, 
all right, here's, you know, Tank Sinatra. But they know what's going on because they have headphones on. So they go, you know, two minutes, 90 seconds, a minute, 30 seconds, 10, five. And then they, I was like, wait, what? And then they just push you out and you're like, it, you are, I don't even know how to describe it without using animal, like, so I'm a smart person and I know how to handle myself in almost every situation, but that it, it didn't matter. None of that mattered because my caveman brain and, and nervous system, when you walk out and the lights are shining so bright and 800 women are screaming in your direction, your body goes, oh, I have to fight 800 women right now, immediately. I don't know, this shows I have to kill everyone because they're gonna kill me. That's what I felt like. Sorry to the women in the audience, but I really did think, I was like, let's fucking, let's do this. I've been practicing for this moment. So that was, you see that in my face in the clip of me walking out. Um, so I go out there and I sit down and I do remember a few things, but they're like so, it's weird because they're not, they're such strong memories, but they're also like, they almost feel like they're not my memories. Like it was almost an out-of-body experience. So I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm like talking with Ellen and this, this is a thing that I had been working on directly for a year, indirectly my entire life. So I'm sitting there and she's asking me questions and I just like, I was talking to her and I couldn't breathe. And I said, uh, I remember there was one thing that the segment producer goes, she goes, whatever you say, you have to say this. And it was the the thing about, cause I said this on the phone. I said, if there was like a royalty, cause Ellen did a, she did a segment on the Royal family and she like kind of pretended to be royalty. And I was like, she's the queen. Like if there was a, a queen of, I meant to say funny and nice people. Instead I said the queen of kindness. It doesn't matter. The word kindness has a little bit of a softness to it that I don't like that much. But I, I meant to say, if there was a royalty for funny, nice people, you would be the queen. So I said that. And as I said that, I saw her react and I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to fucking Ellen DeGeneres in the, in the flesh right now. And then I looked to my right and there was 800 women stare, standing, uh, sitting there all staring at me. I was like, oh my God, there's a whole audience out there. And then I forgot, I was talking to Ellen and I looked back and I said, oh my God, this is fucking Ellen DeGeneres. And then they were like, all right, thanks for coming on. No, so then I did the live memes, which I um, was a little nerve wracking because I didn't know if she was gonna laugh at all, but she did, which was beautiful. I wanted to do three things. I wanted to tell her, how much I respect her and what I, uh, how much I appreciate what she did, what she does for people. I wanted to make her laugh and then I wanted to like privately thank her. And then when I got up and, uh, and she hugged me and I, and I left, she said, I'm really excited about all the stuff that we're working on together. And I was like, oh God, Ellen, wish you weren't gay because I would marry that ass. Um, no, I'm just kidding. You, you, whatever. Uh, Shannon, you can edit this part out, right? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. So, um, the wrap up on that is that uh, when I walked off the stage, I saw the producer, Corey, I was like, I'm sorry, man. I don't, you know, sorry. I didn't know what to say. I was like, I, I, I feel I fucking blew it. He goes, are you kidding? You did great. And I was like, are you, I don't know. Are you being serious? He goes, yeah, you did fine. You did great. He goes, you, you, he goes, you did exactly what we thought you were gonna do. Maybe even a little better than that. I was like, all right, that's what more can he ask for? And we happened to be standing right by a, um, right by a picture, very famous scare prank that she did uh, on Diddy. So there was a person dressed like it in a box on the stage and the guy jumped out and Diddy lost his mind, jumped out of his seat, ran across the stage and started like dancing off the, the scaries. It was one of the first ones I think they did. It was definitely one of the biggest ones. So he points at the picture and he goes, you see that, that right there, that picture? He goes, that's me, I'm dressed as it. And he said, the reason that we're able to scare everybody at will on this show is because no matter who you are, when you walk out on that stage, you forget who you are and what you're doing and where you are. It's just it's just part of human nature. He goes, so I'd say as far as that's concerned, you did great. And uh, he goes, and you know, let's be honest, you're no Diddy. Like I've never performed for 70,000 people. So that was my experience on the Ellen Show. If I had to give it a rating, which I don't, but I'm gonna, I would give it five stars, A plus. They're just such a professional entity. Like there's a reason that that show is where it is in, in the, you know, the zeitgeist of culture. It's at the very, very, very top. And I believe that um, when, I, when I worked for the fence company, I started with the fence company and there was two employees. 
there was one really nice guy and one kind of like, you know, not a not an asshole. He just like wasn't that nice. He just like wasn't, he was like hard to talk to, kind of weird. And the guy who was nice, when we started to expand, obviously you asked the employees who are already working there, hey, do you know anybody who wants to do fence? So as they started to build their tiny little family trees underneath them, there was a, 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 a very noticeable difference between the nice guy's family tree and the, the mean guy's family tree. The nice guy's family tree was like 10 or 12 nice, nice people, hard workers, never complain. And the other guy brought in a bunch of people who were like surly and kind of like, you know, they didn't want to work that hard and whatever. So with Ellen, her being at the top, the matriarch of the whole, the whole thing over there, the queen, if you will, <laughs> um, it's very apparent that she knows how to hire people and she knows how to pick people and she gives as much as she expects because just because she's at the top, that doesn't mean that she, you know, she doesn't work hard. I actually, I feel for people who work for somebody who think that it's enviable or, or better to be at the top. Being at the top, like Undercover Boss is one of my favorite shows because the CEO has to go work with the people and he gets to know his company and all that. I think there should be the reverse where an employee goes to be the CEO of a company for a week so they can see that it's not what they think it is. It's not what it's cracked up to be. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of decision-making. Your time is completely and totally devoted to and consumed by the the the, the company and the profit. That's really all, the, you know, most companies exist to make money. And having whether it's five, 500, 5,000 employees, the more employees you have, the more stress you have. And you don't necessarily make that much more money just because you have all these employees. It's just a lot more stress. So she works very hard and everyone underneath her works very hard. And everyone was so nice and so professional. And like I said, there's a reason that she is where she is. And that's because she is about as real and authentic as it gets. She's as hardworking as it gets. And she also is really good at picking people. And Jim Rohn, who was like Tony Robbins' mentor, gave a speech once and I and I got a lot out of it because he's he kind of laid out the path to success as far as what level of success, financial success, do you want to achieve? Do you want to just kind of be a body? Do you want to be a doorman or somebody who takes ticket at, tickets at a movie theater where there's no real skill involved? It's just kind of like making sure the place doesn't burn down. That's fine. If you want to make more money, you have to develop a skill. And you have to make sure that the skill is in demand and is, you know, people will pay for it, you know, over and over and over again. So he goes through all these different layers and he said the the person at the who's going to make the most money and be the most financially successful is the person who makes people their skill. So if you want to be at the top of a company, you have to be really, really good with people. And then if you can manage the expectations and the work ethic of 10 or 15 people, those 15 people can manage another 75 people and those 75 people can manage, you know, infinite numbers of people. That's how it goes. So if you, you know, if you're, if, not only is Ellen a great comic and a great worker, she also is very good at picking, hiring and managing people. So that's how you get on the Ellen show and make memes and create Tanks Good News. And uh, I don't really know how somebody who doesn't, is not already in the game would do it. I would just say that if you are, um, I just started a new page. Shannon, did you see the new page that I started? Oh, it's so funny. Oh, God. <clears throat> when I thought of that page, um, I thought of it a couple of weeks ago and I just kind of didn't, didn't do anything with it. And then I started actually running it and posting about it. And it's apparent that there's a real hunger for that kind of content because of the society that we've become. It's called Influencers in the Wild. And... It's something I'm very interested in because we've become a culture of content. We're a content culture. Everywhere you look, whether the person has five followers or five million, they want something to post on their Instagram or Facebook so that they can get likes and they can find out if they're worth loving. Sadly, that's really what it is. And I'm right with you. I'm not saying that I'm above that in any sense of the word. I'm just saying that that is what it is. It started out, selfies were born out of MySpace Selfies were born out of embarrassment. That's why selfies started happening because you couldn't say, hey, can you take a picture of me? The person in 2005 would be like, why? You couldn't just say, oh, I just want to have a picture of me. You had to tell them it's from my MySpace profile picture. So rather than you know, ask somebody 
if they would take a picture of you for your MySpace profile picture, you just turn the camera around and take a picture of yourself. That's where selfies were born out of. Now, selfies are obviously much more socially acceptable. You see people doing it all the time. It's really not a big deal. But I'm just fascinated by the fact that every time you see somebody standing in the middle of the street with a row of buildings behind them, or they're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, or they're wh wherever they are, they're basically asking the world if they're worth loving, which is crazy, but that is what it is. That's what I think it is anyway. That's what it is when I take a picture. When I take a picture that I want to post, I'm posting it and saying, do you guys think I, you guys think I should not, you know, you think I should exist for another day or not? It's a lot of pressure for, for people. That's what it is at its core. Obviously, people will say, oh, no, that's not what it is. I'm, you know, I'm a fashion blogger and I have to show off my outfits. Well, why are you a fashion blogger? Because you want to make sure that you're worth loving. And I assure you, Instagram or not, you're worth loving. That's the, that's the lesson of the page. The lesson of the page is that we're all caught up in this ridiculous maelstrom of likes and, uh, and followers. And to attach any kind of self-esteem to likes or followers is a burden that no human being should have to should have to carry. When when Kanye West wanted to uh when he reached out to Jack Dorsey from Twitter and was like, "We're going to get rid of likes and retweets." Like, "Bro, fuck off." Kanye, just, he's beyond needing likes and and retweets or followers or whatever. But I'm sure Kanye is not dying to get rid of album sales figures. He wants to know how many albums he sold or how many streams he got. That's what's important to him. Whatever is important to you, you want to keep that intact. And for people to say that people's, uh, or for the higher ups to say that, you know, Instagram users' mental health is affected by likes, maybe their ego is affected by likes, but their mental health is completely out of that. That's out of that conversation. Their mental health is a much bigger conversation than, you know, removing likes from Instagram. Because if somebody is attaching their self esteem or their self worth to how many likes they got, their mental health is, is not intact. And there's a lot more work to do than just removing likes. So, I'm going to end on this because uh, I think it's a good idea to talk about books because I love books. I actually, Shannon, have you seen You on Netflix? Of course. Okay. Finished so <laughs> that psycho, the best thing that came out of that, that show is me. I started reading again a lot. You read those books, the You books? No. Oh. I no, no, no. I just like I, I started reading oh, Crime gotcha. and Punishment <laughs> like Joe. I'm not going to kill anybody, but <laughs> I do like reading because- it's like having a conversation with someone who's way smarter than you that's probably dead at this point. And it's one way and you can do it on your own time. It's like on-demand conversation. It is only one way, but whatever. Um, so I started reading Henry David Thoreau again, who uh, I forgot, it was like in the 1800s, I believe, where he went and lived in a uh, cabin on Walden Pond, which was on Ralph Waldo Emerson's property and he lived there for two years and he kind of sustained himself off the land and just wrote and thought. And one of the quotes that just, I, I honestly, I think I'm gonna get it tattooed on me because it's so fucking powerful, especially for the way things are now. And if you think that you are a valuable contributing member of society and you spend eight hours a day on your cell phone, you're robbing yourself and the world of whatever gifts you may have. And you may never find out because you're too addicted to the likes, which brings me back to that other thing. But the quote is, um, as if you could kill time without injuring eternity. Meaning, what that means to me is like, it's so easy to kill an hour or two or three in the middle of the day and not think anything of it, but you're squa literally squandering the only, um, what's the word? Unrenewable resource that we have time. You're just, every second that goes by, you're getting closer to your death, which is morbid to think about, but it's okay to think about if it gets you into action now. And um, as if you could kill time without injuring eternity. So obviously in the moment, you're, you're squandering minutes, hours, or days or whatever, but that lack of action and that lack of contribution ripples into your future. And although you're not killing eternity, you're definitely injuring eternity by killing time. So when I read that quote again, I've read that, I don't know, I've read that that quote probably 10 times over the course of my life. And every time I read it, I'm like, God damn it, I gotta start, you know, start existing in the now. Shit, you know what? On my Instagram, I did a, a questions thing. I wanna answer one of the questions on there and that's how I'll end. Let's see. Sorry, Shannon. Oh, good. You're good? Yep. All right.
Who you got in the Super Bowl? Uh, what's the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> is that is the Super Bowl? Is it like? Do they already know who's playing in it? I have no idea. I have no idea either. Um. Oh man, there's so many more questions than when I. Uh, I might have to do a whole thing. Fuck. Um. So. Oh, Chase Lapard, the guy who who's uh, doing the podcast clips. Nice guy. He's he's back. He's back and he's he's helping. He's into the podcast, and um, I think he's been. He'll say he was listening, and I don't want to fight with you, Chase. But I don't think you were listening, buddy. Um, he goes, "You're a busy dude. How do you balance work and life?" Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. <laughs> I don't know, man. I have no idea. I do know the busiest time in my life, which I measure everything against is was when I was in college. I was in college full-time. I was working full-time. I had an internship at Def Jam in the city that I was doing two full days a week. I was going to meetings and I was, uh, I, wait, I was working, school, meetings, internship. I was going seven days a week and I did that for about six months, maybe maybe eight months. And I really didn't feel it. I didn't get, I, I, I don't know if that's enough time to get burnt out, but if I was gonna get burnt out, that would have been the time period. Now I have Tank Sinatra, Tank's Good News, which I have to you know produce content for and update and engage with people and answer DMs and answer emails and monetize and do all the meetings and try and expand the podcast, uh, the Tank's Good News videos, the I have my family, I have two kids, uh, stepdaughter, wife, two dogs, gym, meetings, friends, don't have any friends. That's probably how I do it, no friends. I have no friends, I don't see anybody ever. Uh, no, I'm actually going to see see one of my friends this weekend to watch the Conor McGregor fight, which is exciting. But I think the only way to strike a balance, balance to me used to mean there was like five areas of my life that I would that I would focus on. One was, uh, you know, relationships, friends, and family. Then there was faith. Then there was fitness, finances, and the other one I forgot. What, maybe it was my recovery. It was one of the, it was one of those. It was like a bunch of different things that I was like, if these are all spinning, if all these plates are spinning simultaneously, then I'm good. And what I would do, instead of trying to give a little bit to each one every day, I would spin the shit out of one plate and then count on that plate spinning long enough to get for me to get all the other plates spinning. But that's not it. Didn't it never worked? I, I, my balance was, in essence, I would go off the deep end in one area of my life, I would go to the gym every single day and diet and you know run and do cardio and just be absolutely rigid and perfect in that area of my life for two months. I would get in shape, but my, you know, I wouldn't, I would not take shifts at work and I wouldn't make as much money or I'd slack on the meetings or whatever. And what happens is once you get into this, you know, this shape where you think, all right, I'm good enough to coast. The bottom line is that you're never good enough to coast in any of those areas. Each one of them requires daily nourishment and the only way to do that is to be constantly aware of what you need and give it to yourself at every moment of uh, of the day, no matter what you're doing. And it is hard, but I don't really know another way to do it. I don't know how you could, like, if the question is, how do you balance work life? My question would be, how do you not balance work life? Like, you don't really have a choice. You can't neglect people. You can't neglect yourself. Or if you do, you you pay for it in one way or the other. So I guess... I'm done paying for neglect. I don't want to neglect my wife, my kids, my work, my fitness, my recovery. I don't want to neglect any of it because I've done that before and I know that at the end of neglect is atrophy and atrophy causes weakness and then weakness sucks and then you got to build it back up again. So I guess the way that I balance work life is just by you know having a, a, the desire at the forefront of my mind not to start over again every two months in any area of my life. So God, it was just 48 minutes. God, I'm such a motor mouth. I talked a lot. How many words was that? Can you count? Yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Oh my God, <laughs> transcript, word count, four million words. I didn't even get to everything. I All right. You need to do it. <laughs> yeah, you had a lot of more faith in me than I have myself. All right, well, for my first solo podcast, I, f I, I feel like I gave you guys some good stuff. I, I said some stuff I got off my chest some stuff that I wanted to get out there into the world. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think next, I'm gonna have a guest, I have a guest plan for next week. She's an interesting, interesting woman and I'm excited to talk to her. But for now, 
Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.